My name is Rick Gunn. I'm a writer and a photographer and a mad wandering cyclist. In 2005, after 14 years as a daily newspaper photographer, I quit my job, got on a bicycle, and realized my dream of riding 26,000 miles around the planet through 33 countries. I'm here today to share a small story from that journey. It's actually a chapter from a book I'm working on called Soul Cycler. And that journey begins in Malaysia, in the jungle, beneath a towering green canopy, past the thick trunked rows of neatly planted oil palms as I ran, crashing through the forest in a pair of poorly crafted Malaysian sandals. I chased the echoes of ever distant voices. On, 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 they cried as they trailed off over a nearby mountain. The land tilted and I began to ascend my mind sinking like a stone into the deepest waters of thought. The world was mine, I reckoned, my entire life on the mend. I'd bicycled 17,000 miles to this point through 25 countries, across America, around Europe, along the Silk Road, into western China, up and over Tibet, 18,000 feet cresting down into Nepal, India, and Bangladesh, into Southeast Asia. I was realizing my dream. Even better yet, I'd been fundamentally changed along the way, ultimately transformed by scenes of war, disease, and poverty. I began dedicating my time off the bike to the greater good, volunteering along the way. As I did, people began to take notice, and I'd gone from being a small town daily newspaper photographer to, be, to being considered for an international television spot, a documentary film, magazine articles, and my journals had been splashed across the pages of countless newspaper articles. Meanwhile, back home, one of my friends, in an email, let slip with a strange new word, celebrity. It was that word that triggered another memory, an older memory. And suddenly I recalled my mother's backhand moving solidly across my face. And with that memory came a message. A dark, deep lie handed down through the generations. You're not fooling anyone, it whispered. You'll never amount to anything. And it was only after I looked inside and truly learned to disregard that voice to replace it with a more hopeful, a brighter, more authentic voice of my own, that the miracle of my life began. Leeches, someone shouted from above, snapping me out of my daydream. Suddenly I turned my attention to the tops of my feet, and there in horror, what I'd mistaken for a handful of clinging leaves were in fact the fat, pulsing bodies of leeches feeding. I jumped and swept and jumped, and when I knocked them off my feet, I ran up that mountain like a man on fire, bolting up across that ridge top, down a double track, back through that palm plantation. I don't like leeches. I ran so fast that the soles of my cheap sandals actually peeled from my feet. Three minutes later, I crossed the finish line, and I thanked the members of the local running club who had invited me there. But I digressed. I was here for another reason. That was to meet someone very important. His name was Mohammed Tajiran from Mashhad, Iran, a country the US has not had diplomatic relations with for the last 27 years. I'd stumbled upon his website the year previous. It's called We Need Trees. I recognized Mohammed as a kindred spirit right off the bat. He too had a dream of riding a bicycle around the world. Only instead of volunteering along the way, he decided to plant trees to help restore the environment. After a year of correspondence, we agreed to meet in Malaysia's northeast island of Penang in a place called Georgetown. Hey, dude, I said when I finally met him there. He said, hey, and he wrapped me in a big old hug. I said, are you ready? He said, I'm ready. And with that, the two of us set out on our touring bikes to put an idea into action. In this case, we would ride across Malaysia, side by side, 
in a symbolic gesture of peace between our two countries, America and Iran. Before I knew it, we were up and rolling from the fra fragrant spice markets in Penang, across the industrial murmurs in the steady center of the country, and then deep into the heart of the central foothills. And it was here a conversation sprang up naturally between Muhammad and I. And he began to tell me about his life back in Iran, the food, the culture, what it was like. And then he began to talk about his family. He told me how much he missed his brother and his young niece, his mother. And your father, I asked eventually. A look came upon his face. It was one that I knew well. My father died when I was young, he said. I said, I'm sorry. My mother died when I was young as well. Do you have a girlfriend back home? I asked him as we rolled along. He said, Rick, I've tried. Perhaps love is not for me. And although I knew this to be a lie, I couldn't tell you how many times I'd said the same thing to myself. So when did you finally realize you were going to ride a bicycle around the world, I asked him. He said, in the beginning, Rick, it was too hard. I'd done everything right in my life. I'd gone to school. I'd earned my degree in engineering. I'd joined a partner. I'd opened an office. I had a successful business. But it just didn't feel right. He told me that then one night on a mountaintop, he's a big mountain climber, he was sitting on top of this mountain, and a beautiful full moon began to rise. And as it did, he began to cry. This in the realization that everything in his life was about to change. He went on to tell me that after two years of hard work and sacrifice, despite an ever-growing chorus of skepticism and doubt from the people around him, he closed that business. He quit that job. He loaded up his bike, and with less than $500 in his pocket, he set out to realize his lifelong dream of riding a bike around the world and planting trees. And as the two of us rolled along this road, the hair on my neck began to stand up on end. This in the realization of how uncannily our stories matched one another. How Muhammad had harnessed the power of pain, transformed it into something beautiful. It wasn't long. By mid-morning, we were well into the hillsides of central Malaysia, where we passed some of some of the most sparsely populated villages in the country. People slowed and traffic calmed, all of them stealing curious glances at the two passing strangers. By lunch, we'd grown hungry, and so we stopped at a roadside restaurant. And again, we garnered the curious looks of a handful of women in headscarves as they cooked furiously over smoking wok. We walked into the main dining area of this restaurant where we came upon a handful of men, most of which were wearing tr traditional Muslim pillbox hats. All of them were either smoking or drinking coffee. The room in engaged in the low rumble of conversation. But as Muhammad and I walked in, the room quieted and all eyes turned. Where are you from, one of the men asked. I am from Iran, Muhammad said. And he, he is from America. Muhammad's confession sent another low rumble across the room, and the man spoke again. But, but you two are enemies. Muhammad took a minute to absorb the man's words, and then he looked him back straight in the eye, and he said, no, we are not enemies. We are friends. After lunch, Muhammad and I continued our ride into the heart of Malaysia's central range, pedaling ever upwards into the dense mountain rainforest. As we did, butterflies flitted, bright tropical birds called, flowers bloomed, mischievous monkeys danced upon the treetops. And it wasn't until some time after that that it happened. The two of us round a corner, and we came upon this massive black wall of rain clouds moving at us rapidly. Uh oh. It began, first, I felt it drop. Then it began to sprinkle. 
And then it began to rain. And this was followed by a downpour of such ferocity that Muhammad had to yell from just three feet away to be heard. I think we should turn around, he yelled at me. Don't be silly, I said. It's just a little rain. Two minutes later, we turned around. About a mile back down the road, we found a small bus stop, put our bikes underneath it, sat on a bench. This while the rain banged like bullets against its cheap tin roof. Five minutes went by, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. After a half an hour sitting bored watching the rain, Mohammed suddenly popped up and walked out into the downpour. When he reached the middle of the road, he lifted his arms, he tilted his head back, and simply smiled. And it was a smile that seemed to radiate from the core of his being, as if every drop of rain was washing away the dark ash of some former life. Later that night, long after the rain had ceased, Muhammad and I set up tents near the white strands of a jungle waterfall. The two of us falling asleep to a multi-sensory show of monkey calls and fireflies. The next morning I awoke at sunrise to the sound of Muhammad's soft utterings to Allah during his first morning prayer. God is not just in the mosque, he would tell me afterwards. He is in the forest. He is in the trees. He is in the animals. Rick, he is in all of us. It was a message that I would carry with me. As our days took on cyclical patterns, the two of us rising in the morning, packing our things, riding during the day, talking, laughing, eating, connecting, and then setting up tent at night just to go to sleep and do it all over again. And during those 10 days that I was with Muhammad, I felt something different within me. I felt entirely at peace and on purpose, as if I was doing exactly what I was meant to do in this lifetime. Several days later, Muhammad and I cycled upon the shimmering waters of Malaysia's east coast. And as my time began to come to an end with Muhammad, I became acutely aware of his presence and how all those things that others said had separated us, had all but disappeared. And for that time, I saw us clearly for what we were. Two men who had been born, who, who would live, and who would die. The two of us united in the sacred intent of leaving the world just a little bit better place when we were gone. My last stop with Muhammad was the small town of Kuantan along Malaysia's east coast. And it was there we agreed on one last final task, symbolically. We made our way to a nursery and bought a small tree, looked for a fitting place to plant it. Someone suggested a nearby AIDS clinic. So before long, the two of us had dug a hole and planted that tree, a tree that still remains there and grows for peace. Meanwhile, back home, in our respective countries, our most powerful leaders hurled vitriolic accusations at one another. Terrorists, infidel, Zionists, nuclear war, annihilation. They were all the tired old verbiage and miscommunication of those who tragically mistook the love of power for the power of love. When it came time to go, I wrapped my arms around Muhammad one last time, and tears began to fall from my eyes. Not just because I'd missed the man, or not just because we were part of something much larger than ourselves, but because I didn't know how I would handle it emotionally had I learned sometime in the future that my country had rained bombs upon his and somehow hurt this man, or his brother, or his young niece, or his mother, or any of the other good people of Iran. I love you, I said to Muhammad before I left. I love you too. And before I knew it, Muhammad Tajran was on his bike and riding away. Five days later, I cycled well south, took a boat to the tropical island of Kioman off the coast of Malaysia. 
And one afternoon, I sat on an empty beach thinking about Muhammad, his laughter, his piety, his courage, his purpose. And then I recalled something that happened as we were riding along the way. We were hungry one morning, and we stopped on the side of the road to talk to a woman. And she became curious. She asked us a bunch of questions, and then at the end she asked, Where are you from? I'm from Iran, Muhammad said, and he, he is from America. I recalled how the woman was set back, dumbfounded. But, but you two are enemies, she said. This now prompted a smile on Muhammad's face. He said, no, we are not enemies. We are friends. We are friends and we are riding together for peace. And with that, the woman disappeared inside a bakery where she worked and she came out with two hot pastries and she put them into our hands and she said, here you take these and God bless you. Because we here, the people of Malaysia, we here love peace. Thank you. That's all I have.